Welcome everyone to week six of the ABCD ReproNim course. Uh, I'm Dave Kennedy, as always. Uh, Angie isn't able to join us today, so both Jessica and I have to tag team to fill Je uh, Angie's um, uh, shoes. And so we're gonna try to do our best to, uh, to muddle through without her. Uh, and we send her our best. She's a little under the weather. Um, so a couple housekeeping notes. Uh, we've noticed that uh, participation is waning a little bit. Uh, to some extent, uh, that makes a lot of sense. It's been a very busy, crazy time for everybody. And so we're hoping you know, the break uh, that's coming up will give you all a chance to, to catch up a bit. And I know we've always said that you know, this is a asynchronous course. So to some extent, you can binge watch it along with uh, Breaking Bad anytime you want. But you know, it is actually helpful you know, to keep up. Our TAs and are here to help you, and it's easier for them to help you if you're kind of keeping along. So while it's not a huge problem to be a little bit out of sync, we do want to encourage you all to try to catch up, use the break uh, to uh, get up to, you know, up to all of the uh, session, up to section six in your activities. So that'd be great. So just want to encourage you to do that. Session two uh, will uh, start on January 15th uh, in terms of the question and answers. Like uh, Netflix, all of our uh, videos will drop on about January 8th or so, so you can uh, you know, start to catch up uh, and, again, binge watch, if you will, uh, uh, Hill Street Blues and, and the uh, second session of, of uh, this course. Uh, so, yes, catch up, uh, do your exercises, and uh, you know, make sure that you know, everything is, is you know, understandable, because we're here to help make sure that uh, everything goes well. A quick note that we're having you know, a celebration of the end of the first semester or the first session uh, after this uh, uh, Q&A in a gather town um, uh, situation. Uh, all the students enrolled in observers, instructors, TAs, friends, everyone you know, is welcome. Uh, you've been emailed the link and the password to join, and that's also available uh, in the you know, enrolled student Slack and on Neurostars. So again, just a social, a chance to pretend like we're in a real class and actually see people and, and talk to people and you know, behave semi-normally for, for, uh, for a little bit of time. So our speakers uh, this week that you've uh, hopefully seen already are Krista Listall and David Keeter. I'll introduce them. I'll have them both say a word about themselves. Krista, welcome aboard. Hi, I'm Krista Lisdahl. I'm a professor of psychology and neuroscience at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Um, my primary area of research interest is in the kind of neurocognitive and health effects of repeated substance use um, during adolescence and young adulthood. I'm also interested in risk and resilience factors that lead to you know, different trajectories of substance use disorders and also more broadly interested in adolescent health. So I look at things like sleep quality, um, relationship between aerobic fitness and physical activity and body fat distribution and neurocognitive health in youth. So happy to be here. Great, and thank you so much. And uh, also with us today is uh, David Keeter from UC Irvine. Say hello. Hello. Uh, I'm David Keeter from uh, the University of California, Irvine. I'm a research professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Human Behavior. Uh, so I, I mostly do uh, neuroimaging, uh, applied machine learning, and informatics work. Uh, the neuroimaging work is mostly focused on um, function and dementias. Uh, and so I use a variety of modalities, PET, MRI. Uh, to look at those sorts of things. Also involved in some uh, projects to look at early life uh, fragmented care um, and its effect on cognitive development in adolescence, which is pretty interesting. But my, you know, my role is generally neuroimaging. Um, I think that's it. Thanks. Great, and thank you. So. Um, my last little introductory statements is to echo Angie's uh, plea from last week for everyone to stay safe out there. Uh, these are challenging times and uh, the holidays make that even more challenging. So uh, urge everyone to stay safe and stay cautious and stay well out there. And uh, she said it more eloquently that last week, but I did want to, uh, to echo that sentiment. So some reminders, enrolled students, please complete your ABCD data access uh, duck status survey so that we can keep track of who has ducks. Does ducks you know, need to be in place? for the project week. And so we need to manage how we're doing project week based on who all has their ducks in a row. 
So please fill that out and keep us up to date on how you are doing on that. If your duck has been approved, please remember to complete that access confirmation survey in Canvas for the enrolled students. So that uh, helps us work out all these details. So that's my introductory stuff. I'll turn things over to Jessica for additional hellos. Hello. <laughs> um, yes, uh, welcome to week six. This is, as Dave mentioned, the last week of session one. So good job on making it through all of session one. Um, we are gonna, like David said, take a break um, and reconvene on January 15th for session two. Um, we, I do have some announcements today uh, just to make about general course stuff and to-dos and whatnot. But before I go into that, I just wanna introduce Adam Richie Halford, who is a TA for the course. I don't believe you guys have met Adam before, so I wanna give him just a, a sec to introduce himself and tell him a little bit about what he does. Uh, thanks, Jessica. Hi, everyone. I'm Adam Ritchie Helford. I'm one of your TAs for the ABCD Reprenim course. Uh, I'm a postdoc at the University of Washington eScience Institute, where I focus on developing uh, statistical techniques and software for the analysis of diffusion MRI. Uh, and I'm also interested in the effects of child adversity on white matter development. And of course, both of those research aims are uh, well suited to the ABC data set. So uh, I'm excited to be working with all the students out there and also really excited to, to see this community kind of coalesce around the, the project ideas for project week. So thanks, Jessica. I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, so Adam today is going to be our lead TA. He's going to be uh, posing some of the questions that you guys have submitted to Krista and David. Um, before we go into that, I just want to do some general course announcements. Um, parallel what um, David Kennedy said about this being a tough time of year. Um, and just generally a busy time of year. I mean, so there's a lot going on right now in the world right now. So um, we have noticed that some of you guys have been um, falling off in your participation with the course. That's okay. Uh, this break is a good opportunity to catch up on the quizzes that you or the data exercises that you haven't been able to complete. Um, and uh, we still will be on the uh, enrolled student Slack and the Neurostars uh, to field any questions you might have about that. Um, we are getting some feedback from students uh, that some people are having difficulty with some of the more technical parts of the course, uh, like executing shell or git commands, running or scripting programs and installing software. Um, so I wanted to just take a moment and give a little um, feedback about what we've been talking about, about the best ways to support you guys if you feel like you need some help on those topics. Um, we have created a resources page on the materials uh, webpage, which is um, abcd reprenim um, dot github dot io slash materials slash resources. Um, so if you go to the materials page, that's where all the weekly stuff is, you should see a link that says resources. Um, and that is where we'll be adding some content for you to maybe uh, go through or cover or just learn more uh, about the type of more technical stuff that we've been hearing uh, there's been some struggles with. And we'll add more stuff to that as we find more resources that we think could help. Um, also, uh, for enrolled students, uh, we've been noticing that not a whole lot of people have been attending the TA uh, help hours, which is okay because, you know, they're optional. And um, I'm not sure if the times are the most optional, <laughs> the most uh, uh, great for people, but uh, that is also a great place to ask some of these questions that you might be having about these technical issues. Um, for the observer students, the Neurostars, um, and, and for the enrolled students, the Neurostars is also a great place to ask these questions and have uh, the TAs and the instructors um, help you and answer these questions. Um, if you are having difficulty installing some software or um, understanding some of the more technical aspects of that, this class, reach out to the TAs through one of those platforms uh, because they will be available to help you on an individual basis. Um, and we're also going to be sending out a little bit of a, a session one survey uh, over the break, uh, which will be a good place for you to kind of give us some feedback about if there's anything else that uh, you feel like we could be doing to help you in this area. Um, Let's see, also uh, just for over the break to do's um, other than 
kind of catching up on some of the quizzes and lectures that um, maybe you didn't have time for recently. Um, heads up about homework six for this week. Um, it might be a little bit more challenging technically than other weeks. Um, and uh, just, a, we'll just know that we'll be uh, on the Slack and on the Neurostars uh, to field any questions about that. We're also going to be starting to roll out um, some uh, homework solutions uh, that you can check if you get stuck on a place. Um, so uh, hopefully that will help too. Um, let's see, there will be a over the break data exercise. It'll come out probably in the beginning of December. Um, and the point of that is um, not gonna be covering any one topic in particular, but kind of going to be a review of all the main topics that we've talked about here and have an opportunity to get um, you guys a chance to really dig in a little bit to some ABCD data, which uh, we haven't actually done in any of the previous um, uh, data exercises. Uh, the last set of announcements I have before we go into questions are about project week. Um, so we have a, a kind of exciting announcement about that. Uh, so we had previously set it up so that only enrolled students are able to attend Project Week, but um, it's also the case that not all enrolled students have ABCD data access. And so we've decided to open up Project Week uh, to uh, some observer students, and we're gonna evaluate the number of active participants, active students who have completed quizzes and um, been taking part in the course at the end of the break and invite people um, to participate in Project Week based on the number of people who have done the data exercises. So if you are an observer student and you are interested in participating in Project Week, make sure that you do those data exercises and then we'll reach out to you to see if you are interested in um, taking part in the Project Week too. Um, and another uh, announcement about Project Week, the project proposal submission portal is now open. So I wanna walk you through um, how to do that a little bit. So I'm gonna share my screen really quick. Um, oh gosh, we have so many windows on my screen. Okay, so we're gonna, gonna share my screen. Um, and we set up uh, these project uh, proposals uh, so that, here, hold on so that I can see. So that you submit them basically as issues on a GitHub repository. So um, this is our ABCD ReaperNim GitHub, and uh, the projects repository is when we're going to where we're going to be taking in uh, all these project proposals. Um, if you navigate here, you can see the README file, which walks you through how to submit your project proposals. Um, so uh, I, I know right now it says that the ABCD ReaperNim course. Project Week is limited to enrolled students, but we are going to update that because we are now accepting, like I said, um, some observer students who have completed all the exercises and been actively participating in the course. Um, if you have a project idea, we are excited to have you propose it. And basically, the way that you do that is you would click right here, which will take you to a, a template here and you can click get started and then you can enter in the title of the project that you are interested in working on for project week and you can fill in this template what your research questions are you can describe the project a little bit and you can add some keywords or tags that will help us uh, kind of organize these projects as they start coming in um, if this out uh, uh, template is a little overwhelming for you and you don't know exactly what to put in there um, we have uh, an excellent example proposal um, that was provided to us thanks to our stellar ta dustin over here who um, put in a like an example research proposal based on a pre-registered report that he did a little while ago where he put in what his research questions is he described the project a little bit and added some keywords um, so if you have a project proposal that you would like to potentially work on for project week please go to the abcd ReaperNim projects github repo and submit it as a github issue um, and we'll be kind of looking through these and organizing them. Um, and I just wanna quickly note, um, we want your ideas here. Um, projects can always be improved over time. If you think that you maybe wanna do a project, but you think it's a little silly, 
please don't feel that way. <laughs> Propose your ideas. This is an idea space. Um, and if you want to talk more about them before you propose, you can also have go those conversations on the Neurostars or on the Slack, but we really would love to see some of your ideas come in. Um, let's see, last announcement about Project Week. Hold on, let me make sure that I get it up here so I get the right date. Um, so we want your ideas to flow, basically, but uh, we obviously need to have some idea of what projects we might want to uh, structure the project week around before project week actually happens. So there is a deadline to submit a project proposal and it's gonna be on February 12th, which is two weeks before the last course session. So um, this break uh, is a pretty long break for the course. We reconvene on January 15th. You. Um, should try and keep uh, just in the back of your mind what kind of projects you might want to work on if you are planning to participate in Project Week. Um, and I know that's always a lot of announcements, so sorry about that. But last thing before I turn it over to the questions, um, just paralleling what David Kennedy said, um, we're really looking forward to meeting you face-to-face, -face, I guess virtually face-to-face -face in the session one social hour in the Gather Town. Um, that starts immediately after this session. Um, and I will, uh, post it in the Slack and in the Neurostars, what the link is and what the password is. Okay, well, with that, that's all of my announcements. So I wanna turn it over um, to Adam, who I believe has some questions queued up for Krista and David. Okay, thanks, Jessica. Uh, I think uh, I'd like to start with some ABCD questions for Krista. There are a, a few questions here that relate to sort of the, the taboo nature about uh, around discussions around substance abuse uh, and, and the sort of balance between getting authentic answers and uh, not biasing results. Um, so uh, the first question here is, um, uh, you mentioned that you ask if the participants have heard of a substance, if they have not, well, you just mentioned it, so they have. Uh, is there any consideration about how not to bias their experience or responses to these questions? So yeah, that's something that um, we considered. And I have to say that they're not, they aren't really, they don't seem to be responding as though they're interpreting it that way. They, and also, you know, so if you read the whole thing, um, there's a little bit of an explanation of what we mean by drugs. And then we ask, you know, have you heard of these specific drugs? And we ask about um, alcohol, nicotine products, cannabis products inhalants, um, prescription drugs that you're using, not in a way your parent or doctor prescribed. Um, and I think over the counter. And then we ask, have you heard of anything else? And we don't list them. And so if they, if they had interpreted in this way, this very you know, specific way that I think academics might <laughs> interpret it, then they would, the second time we'd ask them, it would be that they've heard of all of them. And that's certainly uh, not at all what occurred. Um, in fact, our data from you know, baseline and year one mapped on fairly nicely to the only other study that I know of that asked the question that way, which was a Texas state study. And that's really where we got the idea from because they were so young and ABCD really started two to three years before any other national studies, you know, like the monitoring the future study that, that's focused on substance use. Um, so in my experience with the kids is they're not really answering the question in that way. Like, well, I just heard you say it. Um, it's more like, have they heard it in their natural world? And we see a very natural progression of them hearing the, of the drugs that completely makes sense. Um, meaning that they hear of cannabis and alcohol and nicotine products, especially ENDS products well before the other substances. Um, Thank you. I know that there was another question in there about more honesty about questions. Did you want me to dive into that? Sure, yeah. Well, uh, uh, yeah, in, in a sort of related question, I, th I think may, this might be the one you're, you're thinking about. It, it, it might be conceivable that the, the questions bias future answers in a, in a different way and that they might spur parent-child conversations uh, around substance use that wouldn't otherwise have happened. Uh, and is, is, do you think that effect would be negligible? And if not, do you have any advice for how to account for this when generalizing to the general population? 
Yeah, so there's a couple issues there. Um, there has been at least one study related specifically to substance use um, on whether or not, sorry, you can probably hear my mouse clicking around, um, by John Briney or Briney, I'm not totally sure about the pronunciation, but they looked at the effects of asking about substance use in a, in a cohort of about 2000 kids um, as part of the Monitoring the Future study that got the questions in fifth grade and then in, in sixth grade, and then an equal number that didn't get the questions in, in fifth grade and found that getting those questions beforehand for one thing didn't spur substance use. Cause that, that's one of the questions that I get um, is asking about this question gonna kind of plant the seed for them to start using drugs. So that's one concern that we get. The other side of the concern um, is, you know, is are asking these questions going to somehow change behavior, maybe that's going to start conversations between child and parents about lots of different topics, and could it change behavior longitudinally. With that, um, I would say yes, that's possible. Um, it's very hard. There, there is evidence for things like suicidality that asking about the suicidal thoughts might actually reduce suicidality. Um, so what might happen in the ABCD cohort, because we do have these seven hour sessions with kids and families, and we've talked about this, a lot of the scientists have, we could have a slightly less risk taking cohort compared to the rest of, of the population. Now we have a sample size of 12,000. We've already seen the onset of some substance use in a very normative way thus far. Um, so the impact of that, I don't know if I can answer how great the impact will be. Um, one thing that we can do is compare, for example, the substance use patterns in eighth graders and 10th graders to something like the Monitoring the Future study, which is a much less intrusive study. And the other thing is I would, I've been trying to caution people that we shouldn't treat ABCD like something like MTF, which is a much more purely epidemiological study because we are establishing, you know, they're coming into our labs, they're with us for a long time, they're establishing relationships. Um, so my guess is our, our patterns of use might be a little bit different. Um, and the other thing is it's not exactly a random sample in the truest sense because we had to have study sites that had neuroimaging, that had all the um, clinical expertise to run the study. So Unlike the real random sample that MTF uses across schools throughout the country, we, we tried to do that as, as best that we could with our random sampling within our catchment areas, but the catchment areas themselves are not random. So this is something to think about. I try, if I if I'm, I'm actually have a paper that I just submitted that looks at kind of baseline patterns of substance use, and I try to make it clearly in there that this shouldn't really be used as like the measure of substance use in the United States. This is the substance use in the ABCD cohort. Um, we do some other things that just try and improve confidentiality. You know, we don't reveal substance use between the kids and the parents. Um, we make that clear at every single session. Uh, we only break confidentiality if it's a real medical emergency, like on site, someone's o having an OD experience right now. So. There is strong confidentiality. Um, on the other side, we do have toxicology measures, including hair samples um, that could go back a few months. And we're trying to get increased funding to analyze more of those hair samples so that we could compare self-reports to the more objective measure. Thanks, Krista. That's really helpful and, and echoes a lot of uh, the things that uh, Hugh Garriman talked about in the sampling week as well. Uh, okay, I, I think maybe we could switch to a repronym question. Uh, one of the questions simply says, I'm confused about how to use semantic markup within the ABCD data set itself. Is this something researchers should do on their own or will it be done by the organizers and then distributed? So uh, uh, I guess that's for me, David Keeter, although I am not uh, funded uh, to participate in ABCD directly. So hard for me to answer that question. Um, I believe that uh, I am part of Repronym and we have talked in Repronym about uh, semantically marking up the ABCD data. 
Um, we haven't gotten to it yet. So uh, I would expect that uh, the these large publicly available data sets um, would be marked up by the data set provider and annotated, and then it would just be used by the community. Um, in the case that you have sort of a smaller data set that's like private or even a, a small data set that you want to share with people, that's, you know, kind of the, the, the point at which you would be doing annotations yourself. But for large publicly available data, that would be done by the data set providers, and in some cases by reprinim. So we've annotated ABCD, or I'm sorry, uh, ADHD 200 and Abide uh, version 1.0 and about 70 or so of the neuro data sets and uh, core. Uh, there's a core data set from Vince Calhoun's group. Um, so we're doing some of that you know, retrospectively, um, but as these tools come online and become more mature, the hope is that new studies, studies that are currently being collected at the point in time they want to share their data, they would do these sorts of annotations. And it's not really that much different than creating a data dictionary for your data set. We're just uh, formalizing it and making it more structured. Um, and we hope that every publicly available data set, even in the past, before these tools were available, would have a data dictionary. Often you find that, but uh, often you find uh, when there is a data dictionary that they're in different formats and different structures and hard to use computationally, that's where these uh, link data methods, uh, you know, improve things for us. And uh, in other cases, they're just, they just don't exist. The data dictionaries just don't exist, in which time you struggle to be able to use the data. Um, Thanks, David. So I'll just add a little bit of, I mean, confirm what, uh, you know, mostly what you said there in that, again, to some extent, ultimately, it's sort of the data provider's responsibility to do this. Um, in the early days, you know, we Reprenim, you know, are trying to work with a number of the large data providers to help them do that because it's kind of a new thing, you know, to do. And so David mentioned a couple and ABCD is one of the uh, collaborative projects of Reprenim. So working on, you know, setting up that with uh, the ABCD, you know, DAIC, you know, is something that we'll, we'll be working on going forward. In the interim, uh, you know, some of the data exercises, you know, for the current students, you know, as of today, you know, do require you, know, you to sort of apply that yourself to the extent you know necessary, as you know that sort of background is being developed. But ultimately, in the future, you know, people, the data acquirer or the data projects, you know, will ultimately be responsible for providing that along with their data, you know, going forward. Which I think is just what David said. So. Uh, thanks, uh, David, too. <laughs> I mean, I can continue to expand, but maybe I should wait. Well, we, we there are some interesting aspects. Uh, go ahead. Oh, okay. So I was going to say there's some interesting aspects about the annotation tools with respect to this question about ABCD. Uh, so we are like we have we have a development version of the annotation tool that will accept red cap data dictionaries. Uh, Azure Data Dictionary. So I think uh, many of the ABCD or uh, assessments, or if not all of them, uh, have been coded up in RedCap. And so, uh, you know, when you go and do that in RedCap, you have created yourself a data dictionary for your data, you know, your data set, um, because, you know, that's how you define the forms in RedCap. You know, you have to tell it the data types and the description and so forth. So uh, our annotation tools uh, should be quite easy to use if you export the data dictionaries from RedCap, you take the assessment data that you've exported from RedCap and you run some of our tools on it, it will use the uh, data dictionary. So now you have like the data dictionary that's associated with your data set for ABCD. That's great. Now people can use it. They understand what the variables mean. Uh, it doesn't necessarily uh, provide us a, a clear path to query across ABCD and say abide or ADHD 200 or something like that because potentially people are using you know different variable names you have to go into the data dictionaries to understand what features are there and so that's really the the second level of annotations we're doing is at the higher level the concept level so uh, for ABCD that's where um, you know it requires more human effort because uh, you know now you you already have the data dictionaries from redcap for the assessments that's already been done. So now the second level of uh, concept annotation really helps us query across data sets. 
And um, at least in the 90M terms grant and repro NAM, um, those are the things we're kind of focused on. Those higher level concept annotations, where does it make sense to do this? What kind of queries are people doing across data sets or would like to do at a high level? Uh, and can we make that work across, you know, rec you know, data sets that were collected a while back, data sets that are collected, you know, now, like ABCD, and, uh, you know, help people find data that might be useful for their work. Uh, so. Thanks, David. I think yeah, we found that some of that. Thank you. Yeah, there's a, there's a related question there to, to sort of these concept terms. Uh, one attendee asks, is there a way to visualize the semantic terms? Uh, say, if I wanted to return all studies that have a working memory fMRI task and an out of scanner working memory measure, what's the most intuitive way to find these? So the, the interfaces to do these queries are a repro NIM task that is in development. So I'm some of what I'm going to say exists, and some of what I'm saying to say is a future work that we're we're going to do in ReproNim. So, uh, so let's see. So what we've done now is we've annotated some data sets. We have those in IDM files um, that are available on a GitHub repo. Um, you know, anybody can download them. They're RDF files. I have created some uh, a demonstration uh, for Open Neuro of how to essentially collect these concepts across a bunch of files. And in Open Neuro's case, it's a bunch of data sets. Um, and as you know, uh, there are, so we have a Python based uh, API called PineIDM. PineIDM comes with a query utility. The query utility has a REST API. That REST API lets you uh, query across any number that you select of IDM files to say, you know, give me all the data elements or give me all the concepts, that sort of thing. Um, that would be one route to, you know, say, let's take a bunch of these IDM files on our, you know, download them. They're pretty small on my command line, do some queries and get a list of the uh, concept level annotations or the data, the, the data dictionary level kind of annotations. Um, and the query demo I made for Open Neuro essentially, uh, did that, it did it using a slight variant of the NIDM serialization. It didn't use turtle, it uses JSON LD, but essentially the same thing, graphs. It loads up all the JSON files, it picks out the uh, concept level annotations, which have the predicate is about, and um, you know groups those together and creates a little interface for you to use those concepts. So now the, the way that the query goes, is says, you know, essentially, um, give me all data sets that are marked up with the concept of working memory. And, um, and then you have a list of these data sets and you could then interrogate, well, what was the variable in these data sets that was associated with working memory? And now I can look at those variables because you have the data dictionary and say, you know, do they match across to these particular studies? Like, uh, can I, or, or at least can I combine the data? Can I take variable from study one and variable from study two, both that were measures of working memory and um, use those together or not? And the way I can determine that is by looking closer at the actual data dictionary for those two variables. But my initial query says, hey, just find me everything with a measure of working memory or find me all data sets with a measure of working memory and an anatomical MRI scan, you know, stuff like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, and so then the last part of that question, Repro Lake is this, uh, you know, uh, graph-based database where we uh, are uploading these IDM files to it. Currently, it does not have a front-end graphical user interface uh, besides, you know, a Sparkle query engine. So if you know how to write Sparkle queries, like, you could go in there and write yourself a Sparkle query. We have some saved, but really what we envision there is exactly what you're talking about. There's a graphical user interface that sits on top of it. It tells you what data sets have been annotated. It allows you to see which concepts have been linked to those data sets so that you can select amongst those concepts um, in like a point and click way. Um, yeah. So that's coming soon. Uh, pending repro and renewal. <laughs> Great. Thanks, David. Um, 
Uh, let's switch back to another uh, ABCD question uh, for, for Krista. Is, is there any consideration for changing state laws? Uh, and, whoa, sorry, I lost the question uh, as I was reading it. I have it. Uh, there um, we go, yeah. <laughs> uh, for example, changing cannabis laws or Oregon's new law to decriminalize other substances. Uh, this might be a relevant factor that would need to be encoded in the data somewhere. Yeah, so um, I am the co-chair of the um, lead drug policy work group that's been fairly recently developed, although we've been talking, there was a larger umbrella work group that talking about all kind of geocoded data. So we do have um, some geocoded data that is uh, that has like the state level um, marijuana laws at at the time of that assessment point. Um, I will say that to really look at the effects of policy, um, state level, you know, yes, no, legal or not, is is not a very sophisticated way to do it. So we've submitted. Um, Myself, Wes Thompson, and Rosalie Pakula, as well as some other collaborators have submitted a grant to actually do a much deeper dive into local policy for alcohol, nicotine, cannabis, and um, opiates that, that pull several factors such as availability, access, and price of the different drugs in, in all of the um, participants' census areas including some information about school policy. Um, so to really look at the effects of policy, oftentimes you have to look at local policy because even if the state has a ruling, that doesn't mean that your county or city has legal marijuana, for example, or allows you know, dispensaries, things like that. So we're trying to do a deeper dive on that, um, but it the deeper dive really requires funding. But at the more basic level, we do have information on, you know, yes, no, is marijuana legal for medicinal or recreational purposes, or just CBD, for example. We also ask some questions in the substance use interview about um, their perceptions of whether or not cannabis is legal, for example, because oftentimes that doesn't match the actual policy. In other words, a lot of, um, especially youth, as well as the parents really don't know what their their actual cannabis policy is where they live. Thank you. Yeah. You also mentioned at the end of your uh, lecture that um, you were collecting data on the effects of batteries administered remotely during COVID. Uh, has there been any progress on these results? And if so, you know, could you share some with the group? Yeah, I'm just, I'll warn the group, this is going to be complicated um, over time. So uh, we've started in very internally on the substance use work group, just, just eyeballing the different rates of responses, um, for example, like expectancies about alcohol or peer drug use or your own use um, at the two-year and three-year battery, because both those are the years that are affected right now and whether you were administered it virtually or in person. Because one of the complicating factors is these things dramatically shift during this time period. So right now we're running year two, three, and four sessions, and the ages are generally 12 to 15 or so. And we have this like really exponential change in substance use at the same time as this pandemic. So we're trying to tease, you know, we have to make sure that we consider age, like we can't be comparing a two year to a three year battery because we're gonna have exponential changes in substance use and substance use attitudes. And we're, we're seeing that in the data already. So right now we're trying to tease that apart. We have brought some of the more sensitive areas like the actual sub person's substance use in, um, to the in-person session for all the sites that can do it. Those are actually administered during hybrid sessions now for most sites where the youth is on site and doing a Zoom from the other room with pictures and stuff, but they have privacy. Um, so I, uh, I'm afraid I can't totally answer that question right now, but for the next data release 4.0, 
the whole scientific community is going to kind of have to reckon with this a little bit. Um, and we're trying to give more advice um, to the consortium that, you know, we do have some preliminary evidence that uh, we get more socially acceptable responding when uh, even if we're doing it kind of virtually through Zoom like this with kids in their households, even if it's in a room like mine where it's private, um, you know, we're thinking just knowing that your parent is on the other side of that door might be uh, reducing your substance use report. So we're really trying very hard to get that portion in person. Thanks. There's one more related question about uh, tendency to give sort of socially acceptable responses. Uh, this question is, is there a concern that as teens get older, uh, they'll be less willing to share their substance use history? And how does ABCD address this? I, I think that's always a concern. I have to say in most of the longitudinal studies, we don't necessarily see that. You know, we see really an exponential rise in report. Um, I think because we do put so much emphasis on privacy and because the kids have had, you know, usually two to three, maybe even four interactions before they're sharing that first substance use or escalation of use, um, just based on, you know, lots of longitudinal research like NCANDA and other, you know, most of the investigators, including myself, have done longitudinal research of in this age range of, you know, 12 to 18, 19, um, asking substance use over time. So we've really using these very established methods um, to capture that and, and being very careful about confidentiality, both for the parents and the youth um, where no information is shared. And we also have the toxicology. So we're trying to get more money again for that hair toxicology, because we do, um, we do have it in 75% of our sample for every time point. And we've started analyzing um, hundreds of samples, which is nowhere near thousands, right? And, but we are seeing evidence of substance use um, that is much greater even in years one and two than we are with self-support, self-report. So we're hoping to increase the funding for that toxicology. Thanks, Krista. Uh, okay, back to David for uh, a reprint question. Uh, with apologies to the note takers, I'm going to combine these two questions. Uh, they're related. Uh, one is, if I disagree with the definition of a semantic term or one does not exist yet for my measure, what's the process of creating a new semantic term? And then uh, related, is there a process to quality check uh, or, or QA uh, or change existing semantic terms? Uh, so, so the concepts, um, so the, for the concepts that we're using right now, we're essentially um, using Interlex, the information resource at UCSD. They uh, slurp in a bunch of concepts from different terminologies like Cog Atlas and, and other places. Um, and so uh, the NIDM terms grant um, was funded from NIMH to sort of uh, improve the way we sort of annotate data sets, that grant has a site through, uh, inter essentially through SciCrunch. Um, and I can put the link, well, I put the link in the, one of the questions that were in the Q&A panel. But again, essentially it's SciCrunch.org slash IDM dash terms. If you go in there, you can create yourself a free account. There is a section where you can add a term. Um, you can do this in SciCrunch.org directly or with an IDM terms um, interface. And essentially there you're creating a concept level annotation, uh, a new one, and that gets stored at Interlax and then is available to others. Um, the IDM terms grants just over a year old. We are working on a method for curating those concepts. It, it'll look something like this. Um, you go in and create a new term, that uh, new concept is available for you but it also uh, is a, essentially an issue on GitHub in the NIDM terms project. And at that point, the community can have some discussion around that new concept. Um, and we don't have a real process yet to decide when that comment period ends. Um, 
but the way we in the back end and in interlax the way we handle things are you know you can you can add as you know concepts um, that you need to that system uh, some of them will be used more often than others the ones that are used most often for our domain which is human neuroimaging we uh, group together essentially into a bucket of 90m terms and those when you do your annotations for your data sets using our tools those are the first set of terms that come up for you but there is a selection in our annotation tools that says broaden your interlax query and what that really means is let's search beyond the 90m terms you know bag of concepts you know the first level bag of concepts that we think are most often used um, and that would we encourage you to use and if you broaden your query you should find then the new uh, concepts that you've defined um, but that's that's where we are right now I, I know it's not um, it's not satisfying for really anybody <laughs> uh, except that we're sort of guiding you with these tools to the concepts that uh, there's the same set of concepts or bag of concepts that everybody else who uses these tools is guided to uh, and the hope is then that you can, you will be able to query using those annotations across data sets. Now, if you add a new concept, right, after the curation period, if it gets added to the 90M terms bucket, then all of a sudden it's going to be more heavily used, I guess, than if it's not. Um, so, but that's the, that's right now what we've got. <laughs> can I add a little extra question to that in that very often, at least in my playing around with those functionalities, you'll find through the nice extended searching that the NIDM markup tools let you do that there are a bunch of, you know, terms like what you want to do that, you know, get returned to you. And as you start to think, oh, that looks right. You look, oh, it's not really defined all that well, or the definition is blank, or it doesn't have mins and maxes. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that each of those terms could have. And yet you run into a lot that aren't from other sources, you know, just aren't completely filled out. Do you recommend if you don't perfectly love an existing one to make a new one that is more complete and then worry about the fact that you're duplicating kind of a term that just wasn't well described before? Or is there a different approach to things that are probably right out there, but just aren't filled out as much as they should be? I don't know if that makes any sense, but. Uh, well, okay, so the way these information resources work, um, is that you know you have a say you have a concept that's there and uh, you don't entirely agree with the definition or you want to make a new version of it with a slightly different definition. Um, so in the information resource, that's a new term. Like you're adding a new concept and it gets a new uh, URI and the old you you know the old term still exists in that information resource. So you're defining essentially a new thing. And what the Interlex folks do during curation is link that new version of the concept to the old version of the concept. Now, I honestly don't know what they've been doing historically to decide, is it the, is the new concept the one that we're presenting to people or is the older one the one that's the canonical version of that concept? I don't know how they make that decision, but they do link them in the back end such that uh, if you annotate the data set with a revised version of the concept, the new one or the old one, we should be able to um, handle that when at query time. Um, so you don't necessarily lose anything by adding a new term. In fact, you may enrich that term as long as they get synonymized and both come back to you. I'd rather have the more complete result as well as whatever historically had the old label to it. So, so, so in other words, I would interpret that as encouraging getting the addition of the most complete definitions and term uh, well, possible. So, so there's, there's this, you know, there's pragmatism and then there's, I don't know, a uh, hundred percent accuracy. Like, so, so, you know, if you go to any kind of ontology conferences or talk to ontologists or look at the stuff that they work on, you know, they can spend three years, you know, arguing about a definition and, uh, you know, a relationship between one term and another and that sort of thing and get really down into the weeds. So we like to think in, in, in the work we're doing, you know, these are pragmatic things like we, 
you know, we all need to move forward. We all need to, you know, get other things done. We want annotations to be good, but we don't want to spend years, you know, arguing about a definition. So um, I, in my view, the concept level annotations right now, you know, if there is a concept there that uh, makes sense to associate with your variable, but you don't entirely, you know, 100% agree with maybe the description, I'd say use it. If you're adding a concept that's not there, uh, that there's there's nothing like it, or there's nothing that you could use, then that's super useful. Um, you know, modifying because you know this word or that word in the definition doesn't agree with the you know you don't agree with. Um, for us, I don't think that that's useful right now. Um, okay, thanks. Because, I'll stop you surfing yeah. the question. Because I mean, it just it just causes so so you know you just focus on the things we're trying to do. We're trying to capture the data dictionaries of your data set, and we're trying to uh, associate some of those variables with broader concepts to facilitate query across data sets. So, you know, um, if the concept you're associating a working memory task concept uh, isn't completely perfect, it does it have to be? Because really, all you're saying is that you know my data set contains some variables that are sort of about working memory, and you know that that's good enough as a first step for us. Now, uh, querying across data sets uh, like this has been is is hard and is and has historically been um, restricted to let's load all these data sets into a database. You know, you can think of things like Lonnie. Um, and build a query interface for the data that we're formatting to fit our relational database. And so that is much more structured than what we're trying to do here. And so what we're trying to do, you know, give us some concepts, select amongst the concepts that are there. If a concept isn't there, not, you know, uh, then it's not in Cog Atlas and it's, you know, likely not in Cogpo and it's slightly not in Interlax, then yeah, super useful, probably add a, a concept where appropriate, but otherwise select amongst the ones that are there because you're just helping us query as a field across data sets. Um, and, it, and it doesn't have to be you know, like per, the perfect concept. Okay, so we should probably better move on. Thank you though. Thanks, David. Uh, I wanted to give uh, Chris a, a chance to to respond to this question. Uh, this this participant recalls from Kendall and Kendall that they looked into the effects of the order of drug exposure on addiction uh, to certain drugs, and asks, uh, is the order of exposure recorded uh, in how ABCD asks questions? Yes. Yeah, we will definitely be able to look at the. Um, you know, effects of order or even test some of these gateway hypotheses that have been um, controversial in the literature. Um, and the way that we do that is um, when we at each session in person session, so at, at least a pretty much a yearly um, time period, although if they miss sessions, then it's the entire session since their last. So we have this kind of cumulative exposure. We ask them if if they've used each substance category. And then we've also asked them at um, starting at year one moving forward, if that's the first time they've used it. So we kind of have it flagged in a couple different ways. We have on the timeline follow back the earliest date of use that was recorded. And then we also have at each session, you know, was this the first time they used? And then you could find the date that we actually asked them the date that they used. So we kind of asked it in two different ways. There's the timeline follow back where you can get this calculated score of their first date. And then we have it a little bit more concretely in the interview. So we should definitely be able to look at that um, ordering information over time. Great, thank you. Uh, and there's, a, there's another question here uh, with apologies. It's a bit of a compound question, so I'll see if I can summarize. Uh, in adults, chronic pain research, opioid abuse seems to be the most focused on. How about the use of other drugs such as cannabis, alcohol, and other central nervous system depressants among adults with chronic pain? 
Uh, ABCD suggests that the use of cannabis uh, is harmful at a young age. Uh, does this affect continue into adulthood? And how can we gauge risk and resilience factors during adolescence that can lead to or prevent substance use in, a, in adults with chronic pain patients? So I, I'll, I'll let you choose uh, from that uh, what you'd like to, to respond to. Um, first, I'll just say that, that with the ABCD data, if you're interested in chronic pain, I, I'm part of the physical health work group and we do ask some questions about chronic pain and we are indeed very interested in the development of substance use in relationship to chronic pain, especially in youth that have medical conditions because a lot of times those youth are, are actually excluded from other studies. So we can look at this comorbidity between medical issues and chronic pain and substance use. And certainly we're measuring all the drugs of abuse, not just kind of cherry picking cannabis or, or opiates or whatever, we're measuring them all. Um, so we can look at that over time. Um, does the, the, do the harmful effects of cannabis go into adulthood? I mean, I, I would probably need an hour to answer that, but my short answer is it does look like the effect sizes are not as great um, in adults when we're talking about effects on um, mood, uh, sleep, so some of these acute effects or uh, neurocognitive effects. So it does look like the, the effect is greater in, in younger cohorts the versus older adults. And I really wanna emphasize that if we're talking about like neurocognitive effects, the effects might be different if you have a chronic pain condition. So some of Stacy Gruber's kind of late breaking results has shown that in, for example, people with MS or other really chronic pain conditions who are adults that are using low level THC products, that they actually had a boost in their cognition um, with some of that use. So it depends how old you are and whether or not you have some of these comorbid conditions and the cannabis questions are complicated. Um, the last one, can we gauge risk and resilience factors during adolescence that lead to and prevent substance use in adults with chronic pain? Sure, hope so. So um, that's definitely one of the big questions is as we look at this very complex issue of predicting trajectories of substance use disorders. Um, we know from lots of previous studies that it's a combination of things like your own biology, your genetics, the level of neurotransmitters that you have, your own neurocognitive strengths and weaknesses, as well as these environmental and family factors um, from you know, peer substance use, family history of substance use disorder, family rules. And we can expand that out to you know, the neighborhood you're growing up in, the quality of education you have. Um, so the beauty of ABCD is we really do have multiple levels of, of measurement and we can really tease apart some of these very biological and individual factors as well as, you know, drug policy, environment, school factors, peer group, um, to really appreciate that we aren't just our individual biology, but we're affected by the environment that we're in. Oh, sorry, have my alarm going off. <laughs> um, so thank you. Okay, thanks, Krista. Uh, there are a couple more questions, uh, but we have a hard cutoff uh, in two minutes. So uh, if, if you don't mind, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Krista and David um, to maybe follow up on these questions just uh, in, in text and we can follow up with you uh, online, you know, asynchronously. And uh, I'll hand it over to Jessica and uh, David Kennedy uh, for any closing announcements. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, thank everybody for coming today and for joining this webinar. Um, and. Uh, we are going to be meeting in the gather town in uh, about two minutes uh, or whenever this session ends. Um, and uh, we're just looking forward to uh, saying hi to all of you guys and um, all instructors are invited um, if they want to come. So those are my last announcements. Yes, and just an extra thank you and uh, the written answers and the video of this will be available and uh, anything we didn't get to in person, we will strive to answer one way or the other. So thank you all. Thanks everybody for joining. Have a good break. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks Bye. for your service to ABCD in doing this. Oh, thank you guys. <laughs> Stay safe out there. <laughs>